Please be seated. The court is now back in session. As we indicated this morning, before the break, for this afternoon session, we will hear the testimony of the witness, TCW two seven seven, through video conferencing from France. Mr. Dan San is the video conferencing been set up. Dan San, Mr. President, the technical team reports that the linkage has been set up and the witness is awaiting the trial chamber's call. President, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Witness. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Witness. Could you tell us your full name? Mr. President, my name is Philippe Julien Gaufres. I was born on the 24th of February, 1930, in France. Thank you, Mr. Philippe Goffres. As a witness to testify before this trial chamber, you are required to take an oath or affirmation based on your religion. Do you consent to that? Yes, I wish to provide an oath. Thank you. Ms. Miriam Mafesanti, could you please lead the witness to take an oath based on his religion? Mr. Letemont? Mr. Witness, would you please repeat after me? The witness, I shall. I solemnly declare that I shall speak the truth. The witness, pardon me. I solemnly declare that, that I shall speak the truth, the entire truth, and nothing but the truth. That I shall speak the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr. Philip Goffres, based on the report by the Grafie this morning, to the best of your knowledge and ability, do you have no relationship by blood or by law to any of the civil parties in this case, nor to any of the two accused, that is Nun Chi and Kiev Samporn. Is that correct? Mr. President, that is correct. Thank you. We would like now to inform you of your rights and obligation as a witness. Mr. Philip Goffres, as a witness before this chamber, you may refuse to respond to any question that may incriminate you. As for your obligation as a witness, 
to testify before this court, you must uh, respond to all the questions put to you by any of the parties or judges of the bench. And you must only speak of the truth that you have heard, have known, have experienced or recalled directly related to the events concerning the questions put to you by judges of the bench or any of the parties. Do you understand that? Yes, Mr. President. Thank you. Had you been interviewed by the office of the co investigating judges of the ECCC? No. No, Mr. President. I have not been interviewed previously. Thank you. As this witness is the witness requested by Kills and Pons team, he, the team, Kills and Pons team, I mean, would have the, would be given the floor first to put question to this witness. Do you have one hour and 15 minutes to do so? And likewise, for the prosecution and the political lawyers, you would have one hour and 15 minute time allocation for this witness. You may proceed. Merci, Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, Mr. Julien. My name is Arthur Verken. I am one of the lawyers representing Mr. Kyosampon. To begin, I wish to inform the Chamber of your academic and professional background. Obviously, I will be providing the broad outlines of your academic qualifications. Answer. I pursued my studies at the École des Autitudes, the Business Management School in Paris. I was also a student at the National School of Oriental Languages. I worked in banks, and I also worked in the Far East between 1955 and 1956. I returned to France, and as I had uh, met many students from the Far East and students from Cambodia during my business studies, I decided to return to Cambodia to work. So upon my return to France, I decided to uh, enroll in courses at the uh, National School of Oriental Languages, and I learned to speak, read, and write the Cambodian language. I graduated uh, from that school in 1960. That is my educational background. In addition to my degree, I was also employed in several French and Cambodian businesses, and I worked in Cambodia, and I was able to find work in the multinational company Air Liquide. And I worked in Cambodia as the managing director of the subsidiary of the international group Air Liquide. I also worked in Malaysia and Thailand, and I returned to France, where I continued my career with Air Liquide, and I was also a managing director there. When I retired, Some 20 years ago, I joined an NGO that is dedicated to providing technical assistance to emerging and developing countries. And in that non-governmental organization, I uh, am responsible for relations with the Far East. My relationship with the Far East had begun very long time ago. 
I studied civilization and culture of uh, the Far East, which was of great uh, interest to me, as I found it to be uh, a significant contrast to the values here in France. And as I said, it was just after the war, the United States was considered as a model. However, I personally uh, found inspiration in the Oriental and Asian uh, culture and civilization. Thank you very much. You stated that your first trip to Cambodia took place in 1955-1956. Can you please be specific and tell us uh, what brought you to Cambodia uh, during those years? Answer. I completed my military training in the French Navy. I spent two years in Europe and one year in the Far East, and it was during 1955-1956 shortly after the signing of the Geneva Accords, and I was sent there to resolve certain issues in the Far East. I was based in Saigon, in Vietnam. I undertook a certain number of missions in Cambodia and in Hong Kong and in the Philippines. I therefore uh, made uh, three trips, uh, first in my capacity as a soldier, uh, following that in my capacity as a private citizen. Council Verken, thank you, sir. You stated that you returned to Cambodia in your capacity as general manager for the multinational group Air Liquide. Can you please tell us uh, what that company does and the kind of activities that it carried out in Cambodia. Answer, Air Liquide is an industrial group that was established in 1902, some, some 110, 112 years ago. Its main mission is the manufacturing of industrial gases and medical gases, such as oxygen, hydrogen, Organ. It also produces material uh, for the production of those gases. Air Liquide was the first world multinational group based on its uh, profits alone. In Cambodia, it had several production units uh, for the manufacturing of uh, the oxygen as well as carbonic substances and other medical uh, substances such as uh, peroxide, etc. Council Verken, and over the course of your work for the multinational Air Liquide, while you were based in Cambodia, were you uh, residing in this country? and if so, during which period? Answer. When I first uh, applied for a position within Air Liquide, I did mention that I uh, very much wish to be assigned to Cambodia. And at the time, Air Liquide was in the midst of broadening its activities in the country by establishing a new factory and mounting a new company called uh, Sokia, which uh, ha was held 25% uh, by the Cambodian government, 49% by Air Liquide, and 26% by uh, private individuals, uh, mostly Cambodians. I was the managing director. The president of the company, was designated by the Cambodian government. I therefore served under Mr. Sun Van Sai, who had studied in France. Interruption, uh, Council Verken, Mr. Julien, 
Pardon me for interrupting you. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, much time at my disposal. Therefore, uh, some of the details that you are providing uh, are rather superfluous. So I'd have to interrupt you there. I want to uh, just return to the period when you were assigned in Cambodia and working for Air Liquide. Answer, I was there in 1955 to 1956, as well as in 1957, and then I returned to Cambodia in mission in uh, 1974 uh, for the period of one month approximately. Council Verken, can you please tell the chamber if today you uh, have st still active uh, in any business relations or other relations in Cambodia or the Far East? Answer. My main relation with uh, Cambodia is through my wife. When I was in Cambodia, I married a Cambodian woman. We have four children. My wife and I have traveled to Cambodia uh, over past years, but in my capacity as a volunteer for the NGO, my activity is focused mainly on China. And therefore, my work for the non-governmental organization is mostly to do with China. And through my wife, I do maintain several contacts with Cambodians who are either in France, living in France, or traveling through France. Question. Thank you. I wish to turn now to uh, the genesis of your interest for Cambodia. Perhaps you can tell the chamber how you came to deepen your knowledge of the country when you were uh, pursuing your studies in France at the School of Oriental Languages. Answer. I'll have to move back a bit further and start with uh, my studies at the business school where I first came into contact with Cambodian students. And uh, in my uh, graduating class, there were two Cambodians. Now I will attempt to be uh, brief. After 1955, after my return from Cambodia, I came to the decision of wanting to move to Cambodia, and therefore I signed up for language courses, which were mainly liter literature courses and conversation courses. Uh, and I was assisted by Cambodian students who were in Paris. I was therefore assisted by the uh, Khmer Students Union, uh, which at the time was presided over by Mr. Kyo Sampon. I asked him to put me into contact with one or two Cambodian students who were living in Paris and with whom I could uh, exchange and practice uh, conversational skills and which would allow them, in turn, to improve their French uh, through our conversations. Council Verken. And when did the encounter with Mr. Kiyosampo occur in Paris? Answer, that meeting took place at the Cité Universitaire at the student uh, residence in 1957 when I began my language courses. Perhaps at the end of 1957, at the start of 1958, my memory is not uh, totally clear. Council Verken, can you please tell the trial chamber what happened afterwards, aside from the first encounters with Mr. Kyo Sampon, if you met him again during the years that followed? Answer, when he was in Paris, I had the opportunity to meet Mr. Kyo Sampon during certain demonstrations that had been organized by the student body organization that he was in charge of. 
I also had private meetings with him because as I sought to uh, move to Cambodia and I knew that he was writing a thesis on economics and I was working in the industry, I thought it was rather useful and constructive for me to uh, engage in conversations with him. I went to Cambodia in 1971. Uh, Council Verken, I must interrupt you. In order for your testimony to be absolutely clear, let us focus on the French period. You've just stated that you met Mr. Kiersompon at the Cité Universitaire at the university, and you met him there on several occasions, and that you held several conversations with him on uh, the topic of economics. Is that correct? Answer, yes, that is correct. And they weren't really conversations. It was during a symposium that w was organized in the month of March 1959. And at that symposium, there were invited representatives uh, from the former French territories of Indochina, there was a Vietnamese person, a Laotian person, and a Cambodian representative uh, who was Kyo Son Pong. The theme, the subject of that symposium was uh, foreign investment and local investment in each of those uh, countries. Therefore, each of the representatives spoke on behalf of their countries. On the case file, there is a written testimony that you have uh, uh, written and signed. It is under E190 stroke 1.5, 2.5 rather. And attached to this written testimony, there are several annexes, including handwritten notes. They're entitled Notes Taken During uh, Mr. Kyosan Pong's Presentation on uh, Foreign Investment in the Former French Colonies, organized in Paris, the 3rd of March, 1959. Are you indeed the author of those notes? Answer, I am indeed the author of those notes, and I'm rather surprised to see that I was, I managed to retrieve them. Question, were you able to read them recently? Answer, yes. I was able to reread those notes. Question, and how would you describe, uh, based on your memory and based on your rereading of these notes, how would you describe uh, the contents of those notes what kind of thesis was being uh, expounded upon by Mr. Kyosan Pong during that presentation on investments in Cambodia? Answer. He talked mainly about the transformation of a colonial type economy. Whereby a foreign country uh, brings in material and uh, or exploits uh, the local commodities in order to manufacture finished products. And therefore, his thesis was on the country's resources, uh, Cambodia's main industries, which were wood, uh, rubber, agriculture. According to Mr. Kyo Son Pong, it was necessary to develop the industry in order to foster uh, valorization and uh, promote the local Cambodian economy. He also talked about state intervention. However, he did not talk about absolute and total intervention as he made very specific that uh, uh, instilling fear in foreign investors had to be averted. It was important for the industrialization of the country and building necessary infrastructure to support development. I remember seeing in my notes that Mr. Kyo Sampan concluded his presentation by saying that he 
wished for the economic independence for Cambodia and not autarky. That, in summary, is what the presentation was about. Council Bergen, indeed, sir. We have a photocopy of those notes. I will provide the ERN numbers uh, for the purposes of the record. In French, they are 0080-09334. In Khmer, 0097. Seven one, and in English, zero zero nine one one four two two. And with respect to foreign investment, I would draw attention to one of the pages of your handwritten notes. You write. Uh, ex State monopoly may discourage private capital. And further on, on the half page of your written notes, the last sentence reads as follows, autonomy, independence, and not autarky. This therefore confirms what you have just said about uh, Mr. Kyo Sampan's remarks made on the 3rd of March 1959. Is this correct answer? Yes, that is correct. Council Verken. Is the substance of uh, Mr. Kyo Sampan's public presentation a reflection of some of the private conversations that you may have had with him or that you stated to have with him? Answer, absolutely. Uh, the only difference being that the symposium was uh, dedicated to investments, the topic of investments. However, in private conversation, Mr. Kyo Sampan uh, talked extensively about social issues. He said that the economy had to be developed. However, simultaneously, there had to be an improvement of the standard of living of Cambodians, and in particular, the standard of living of peasants. I had other conversations with him on that very topic when I was in Cambodia, perhaps something that we can visit later on. Councillor Verken, over the course of the conversations that you had with Mr. Q. Sampon in France, and during the March Symposium, did you ever talk about the abolition of private property or the prohibition to own private uh, materials or the use of currency. What kind of statements or ideas did Mr. Q. Sampan share? Answer. Si vous deviez, uh... I do not remember. Oui, merci, Monsieur. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Council Verken, please, uh, can you stick to, to have a bit, to have a bit of a, a time gap between uh, the questions and the answers, because it's very difficult for the interpreters to latch on. So it might be good uh, to stand uh, by uh, this uh, rhythm, and uh, the, you are, your volume is very high, and uh, the volume coming from the video link is very low. So all of this makes things, uh, technically speaking, a bit difficult for the interpreter. So I'd like simply to draw your attention on that. Thank you. Oui, moi -même, je... Yes, yes, I also deafened myself a little bit. Uh, um, well, Your Honor, is there maybe one segment that was not properly translated that I should get back to? Not as far as I remember, says Judge Laven. I'm just trying to warn you for the rest uh, of this uh, uh, examination. I will pay attention to this, says Council Verken. Thank you. So, 
if uh, you had to summarize in a few words the kinds of statements um, that were made back then by Mr. Kersompon, how would you go about this? Did he... Were his statements rather left-leaning, you would say? Or was he more middle ground? Uh, what was uh, your impression of Kersompon's statements back then? I would say that what he was saying was not revolutionary. But however, back then, that is to say more than 60 years ago, it was rather innovative. But I would say in today's terms, in regard to French political parties, I would say that it was more socialistic in leaning. So, now let me turn uh, to the period when you settled in Cambodia. You said that this happened in 1961. and uh, that you remained in Cambodia on a regular basis until 1966. And then later on, you went there uh, on more punctual missions. So could you tell us if during this period from 1961 until 1966 and then up until 1974, if I'm correct, can you tell us if you saw Mr. Kersampan again in Cambodia. Yes, I saw him in Cambodia upon several occasions between 1961 and 1966. And I saw him again because I went to see him at his home and I got to know his mother and his brothers. And we met upon several occasions. And once, in fact, I had invited him to come visit the factory I was in charge of. And then he made the little speech then for the staff at the factory. And the factory workers very much appreciated it. And my staff thanked me for having invited him. And Kyusampa, who was a parliamentarian then, had become Minister of Commerce then. And basically speaking, what was the substance of this uh, speech he made? Well, the substance of this speech, I don't know it because he had given this speech in Khmer, it, my knowledge of Khmer was not sufficient back then to understand a political or economic speech of that nature, but through conversations that I had had before and afterwards, I know that he was very much interested in social issues, in the standard of living of the people, and he wanted the peasants to sell their produce at acceptable prices and he, he wanted them to obtain credits easily uh, with reasonable interest rates, which was not the case back then. And he also, we, he also wanted people to take into account health issues, education, training, and I also know that he defended the the interests of the people from the area he had been elected, and he tried to protect them from abuse, from or, or from uh, uh, abusive behavior from rich traders. And he also 
wanted to fight against corruption and against abuse of power. So, does all of this correspond to conversations that you might have had with him in French back then? Yes. What I have said, of course, results from discussions I had had with him either at his home, at the factory, or elsewhere. And you have just said that during this period, that is to say between 1961 until 1966, you had been uh, invited at Kyosampan's home. Can you give us uh, some details about uh, uh, Kyosampan's lifestyle back then, uh, the way that he was housed, uh, the way that he would uh, move about, that he would... Well, his lifestyle was very modest. When I went to Cambodia in 1961, I went to visit him, and he was living with his mother in a, a very small house on stilts n built out of wood, covered with wood shingles. And a few years later, he moved, and he moved to a very modest apartment in brick, however, even though he, and while he was Minister of Commerce, he didn't use a bike to f as transportation, but uh, he used a car, but it was a second-hand car only that was very, very modest. And his lifestyle was always very, very, very simple. And in your professional activities uh, at Air Liquide during those years, uh, did you ever, uh, were you ever led to uh, interact with the Cambodian political class? Yes, because first of all, the president of my company had been appointed by the government. That was, he was a f former, the former head of the Cambodian Railroad, who then became Cambodian ambassador to Washington, and the second president at that company was Mr. Mao Tsa, who had been the Minister of Planification. So among the private shareholders as well, there were businessmen and polit politicians. There was, for example, a former prime minister and members of the royal family, and Sirik Matak. And therefore, through my professional activities, I was in contact with the Ministry of Industry and the Ministry of Commerce. And the simplicities of uh, Kyosampan's lifestyle back then, was it uh, at odds uh, with uh, the lifestyle of uh, uh, the political class that you might have met elsewhere? Well, in, in this political cl class, you had former figures from the Democratic Party who had been eliminated from political life by Sianuk, but who had become traitors and who were living decently. And you also had people who were in power whose lifestyle was probably rather sumptuous, at least in certain cases. And can you quickly give us uh, a general idea of the economic situation of Cambodia? Uh, 
just before uh, uh, the uh, Khmer Rouge captured Phnom Penh. So you 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 traveled to Phnom Penh. You lived in Cambodia until 1966, and you kept on traveling to Cambodia until 1974. So if you were to describe, in very broad terms, the economic situation of Cambodia, uh, what what would you tell us? Well, there were efforts to industrialize the country with the foreign support, in particular from China. China built four factories in Cambodia, a cement plant, uh, a agglomerate wood plant, a paper mill, and a fourth plant I don't remember. And these plants were more or less operational and the situation, economic situation in Cambodia is, as I said to you earlier on, was rather colonial. Their main resource was product was rubber of excellent quality, but that was not processed on site. In 1963, when Norodom Sihanouk met or accepted American aid, with the hope of developing a more national center economy. But the results were not that fantastic. However, the peasants were fed. And through their work, they could eat. There were people who were poor, but nobody was living in dire misery. But however, some people were getting very, very rich thanks to trading international trading or thanks to activities connected uh, with the infrastructure. So the economic situation was the economic situation of a country that was not yet developed, basically speaking. And in view of your education and in view of your intimate knowledge of the economic situation in Cambodia, do you believe that the reform proposals made by Mr. Kusampan were realistic and reasonable and desirable even? Well, his proposals seemed reasonable because what he was seeking was to value the resources in the country in order to usher in a more developed economy and, and a higher standard of living for the peasants and workers. So I imagine that you did not return to Cambodia during the period of democratic Kampuchea. That's so. I only returned to Cambodia in 2005 for personal reasons. And how did you perceive Kyusan Pan's uh, involvement uh, in uh, the democratic Kampuchea regime? Well, The role that Mr. Kyu Sampan played was set up by people who were in power in Democratic Kampuchea because they needed a head of state who was popular and who was respectable. So they ha had first chosen Prince Norodom Sihanouk as head of state, who was very popular, of course, and who was known throughout the world. But when they wanted to change heads of state after a year, they thought 
about Thieu Son Pong because it was very popular. François Ponchot, in one of his books on the history of Cambodia, says that Thieu Son Pong was the idol, uh, the icon idol for the youth. Therefore, he was a respected pers- figure. He had a, a PhD in economics that he had earned in France. He spoke French, one of the five languages of official languages of the UN. He was known by foreign embassies in Cambodia because he was a parliamentarian as well as a minister. And when he disappeared with Hu Yun and Hu Nim, in 1957, a lot of people in Cambodia spoke about this in the embassies and in the private sector and in the papers. So, therefore, he was someone who was popular, who was respected and known. So, I believe that is why he was chosen as head of state for Democratic Cambodia. And you said earlier that you had returned to Cambodia in in the the year 2000, around, and you said in 2005, in fact, and maybe 2006 as well. And during those trips, or even maybe before, or in any case, after the fall of Democratic Kampuchea, did you see Khieu Son Pong again? Yes, I saw Mr. Khieu Son Pong in 1990. He was traveling through Paris. He was staying at the Place de Barcelone, where the coalition government of, Cam- of Democratic Kampuchea had its offices that was presided over by Neodom Suanuk, and the Prime Minister was His Excellency Son San, and Kyu Son Pong was Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I saw him as well in Beijing by chance in 1992, and in 2005 and in 2006, I traveled to Cambodia twice, and I, yes, spent a few days with him and in 2005, I stayed with him in, at his home in Pai Lin. I saw his old house, which was also a wood shingle house, which I... Of course, he, he had found uh, uh, a brick house, but that was not very, very comfortable. And I, don't, and I don't believe that there was running water in this house. And... The following year, in 2006, we traveled together to Anlong Veng, where his elder son was living, and we had lunch with his elder son, who was living in a very, very simple house, and his elder son would sell gasoline uh, for moped drivers, and he was living above the shop. And then I went to pray here with him to visit the temple, and we stopped several times along the way in different villages. And I saw that the villagers still had a lot of respect for Monsieur Kusampo. And you said uh, that uh, you had seen Que Son again in 1990 in Paris. Do you know what he was doing there? I believe that he was traveling to different countries back then to prepare what was known later as the Paris Peace Agreements. I know that he traveled to Africa then as well. And one of my Thai friends, who was the Thai ambassador to Kenya, 
had met him. And I believe they discussed the situation in Cambodia following the invasion of Cambodia by Vietnam. And they discussed Thailand's stance vis-à-vis -vis Cambodia, but I don't know the details of their discussion. But And I saw the ambassador in Kenya, and he told me that he had been very, very impressed by Kusompan's character. I have no further questions, Mr. President. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Julian. Thank you. The President, uh, thank you, Council. Judge Lavian, you may now proceed. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, Mr. Goffre. I am Judge Lavernian. I am one of the international judges, and I have a few questions to put to you. First of all, I would like us to return uh, to your first encounters with Mr. Kusampan in the 1950s. Can you tell us if, in the discussions you had with Mr. Kusampan, if there were any, if there was anything political about these conversations? Well, Your Honor, I only had a few conversations with Mr. Cussompan because he left France in May 1959. So it was only in 58 that I spoke to him, and we did not speak in detail about political issues. However, I understood then that he desired that Cambodia develop towards a democratic and republican democratic regime, and I believe that he wished that this change would happen gradually and not in a brutal way. He wanted to avoid revolution. He just wanted evolution. Question, did Mr. Kersampan tell you that he had belonged to a circle called the Circle of Marxist Students since 1957? Did he also tell you whether or not he was a member of the French Communist Party and of which particular cell? No, he did not tell me about this. I suppose that you had met a certain number of students at the Union des étudiants cambodgiens, and, for example, did you meet in particular someone by the name of Ok Sakun? I don't remember this name. It's possible that I met him because I met tens of uh, Cambodian students at, in Paris. Especially after the Pavillon de Cambodge was built at the Cité Universitaire. So yes, I met many Cambodian students, not all of them. Question. Among these students, did you meet any students who openly told you or that they were uh, communist or attracted to the Communist Party? Yes, answer. Yes, some told me that. And they told me that they had, had particip participated in the Communist International. The Communist International organized major gatherings in Prague and places like that. So. So, probably, I know that 
Cameroon students had participated in some of these gather gatherings, probably members of the Union des étudiants cambodgiens. Question, according to you, was Kesompan someone who could join movements, not because he was following their ideology necessarily, but because of patriotic sentiment or to act as a, a link or to be useful in some way? Answer, I believe that Kusompan, who was single back then, would spend most of his time focusing on the development of his country by being involved in activities of various kinds. His main goal was to improve the livelihood of the Cambodian population through economic development. Question. Que uh, has been heard several times since the start of this trial, and he said regarding his involvement at uh, the Cercle des étudiants Marxis, and on the 13th of December 2011 at 2.20 in the afternoon, it's document E1 slash 21.1, and in French, ERN um, 00761946250, and in English, ERN 00761840-45. So, Mr. Cusson-Pont, and I'm going to try to summarize what he said there, he said that when he arrived in France, uh, he had joined the Cercle des étudiants marxistes because one of his former uh, schoolmates at Sisawak High School was pushing him to do that, Mr. Oksakun. And he said that he finally gave in uh, to uh, his uh, former schoolmates and he accepted to, to join the Cercle des études marxistes because he did not want Mr. Oksakun to perceive him as a coward. And he also said that after having observed the political situation in Paris, he felt the need to take distance in order to think more carefully about the situation. And this is why he went to Montpellier, pretexting that uh, uh, he enjoyed the weather in the south of France more. So, uh, uh, um, are these, uh, what I told you, does this surprise you? Or did uh, Kyo Sampo ever say anything to that effect uh, uh, to you? Uh, answer. I am not surprised. Well, I did not speak about this in particular with Mr. Kyo Sampo, but I'm not surprised. But because in the 1950s, It, only the French Communist Party sided with uh, those struggling for independence in Cambodia. So, for example, Guimolet, a socialist, did not support uh, independence uh, for the former colonies. And I'm therefore not surprised that the single or the only single possibility offered to que son pont was coming close to the French Communist Party, yes. Well, maybe we're speaking a bit more than just coming close, because when he returned to Cambodia, Mr. Yeng Sari entrusted him with the responsibility of leading Le Cercle des étudiants marxistes, and he said the following on the 13th of December 2011, he said that he accepted this task because those who were the most convinced had returned to Cambodia and it was only he who could take charge of the circle. And he saw in that the possibility of achieving something that would be useful by inculcating patriotism uh, to its members. There, therefore, I believe it's a bit more than just 
coming close to the Communist Party because Cusson was a member of the Communist Party in France. He said it. And on top of this, he is at the head of the circle of Marxist students, Cercle des étudiants marxistes. So, uh, however, you said that he was more of a socialist. So isn't there some kind of contradiction here? Response. As I stated earlier, the Socialist Party at the time was not the most active organization with respect to decolonization of former countries. Only the Communist Party Uh, was concerned with such issues, and I believe that Mr. Kiusampan held socialist-leaning economic ideas. Judge Laverne, do you know if among socialist circles, uh, self-criticism was exercised? Uh, was the notion of secrecy prevalent during the period? Moreover, we are dealing with uh, the time of 1957 to 1959, and yet Cambodia had gained independence as of 1953. Response. Firstly, I did not frequent the circles that you are talking about. Yes, the official independence of Cambodia occurred in 1954. However, uh, from an economic stance, colonialism was still quite present up until the end of the 1950s to the start of the 1960s. Judge Laverne, do the words, uh, the work of United Front evoke anything for you, Mr. Witness? Response, no, nothing at all. Judge Ravel, very well. Regarding the image that Mr. Kiusampa would have projected of himself, I recall what you stated, according to which Mr. Kiusampa enjoyed a very popular reputation. He was a respectable man, serious, honest. Can we say that he also enjoyed uh, the image of a man who was rather modest? and who was very trustworthy among uh, many people and circles. Response, absolutely. In fact, Mr. François Ponchot, in his book that I cited earlier, Mr. François Ponchot called Mr. Kiosampan a one-time Mr. Clean. He was someone uh, that he did not share political views with necessarily. However, it does go to show that his popularity was quite great, as was his honesty and integrity, as well as his sense of uh, social welfare. Judge Laverne, if I understand correctly what you are telling the chamber, that is an image that could have been uh, manipulated or used by the Khmer Rouge in order to gain and build trust? Answer, absolutely. Judge Laverne, let's move to another line of questioning which could potentially be more painful for you. Since in the document that you have uh, provided to this tribunal, it is your written testimony, E190, slash 2.5, you state that you lost many members uh, from your own family. You lost in-laws and you lost friends and colleagues. You lost your father-in-law, your sisters-in-law, her husband, four nephews. You state that you lost Cambodian friends such as Mr. In Sokan, Mr. In Sopan, Mr. Sun Kasset, Mr. Tuk Kamdon, Mr. T. D. Pon. Do you know what happened to those individuals? Do you know 
where they met their deaths. Do you know what happened to Insokan Sun Kasat Insopan Tokkamdun? Response, I do not know the details. A very, very long time ago, I held in my hands a list of people who perished at S21. However, I do not recall who was on that list or who was not on that list. I cited a few names. All I know was that there are many friends who are no longer there in 1979. Judge Laverne. Indeed, Mr. Insopan was detained at S21. He is on number 2,989 of the S21 prisoners list submitted by the co-prosecutors. Mr. Sin Kasset was also detained at S21. He is listed as number 1,089. Mr. Kaktam Dan was also held at S21. Mr. Dipon was a prisoner at S21. He was number 1,937. You stated that among those friends you did not see again, there were also many cadres from your company, Sokoa, the Cambodian subsidiary of Air Liquide, who you did not see again. Uh, you referred to Tan Kimyo, Neil Nelly, Yu Yang. Nearly one third of uh, the company that you managed. My question is: Did you ever discuss with Mr. Kyu Sompon the demise and disappearance of these people? Did you ever talk about Mr. In Sokan Sun Kasset In Sopan Tokkomdon? Deepon response. Mr. Kyu Sompon knew those individuals. I think he knew them all because they studied in Paris when I was uh, visiting the Cambodian pavilion at the University of Paris. I never talked about them because I only saw Mr. Kyu Sompon again in 1990 and 1992. I did not talk about the 1975 to 1979 period. Essentially, we talked about personal issues and we talked about our families. Our conversations were relatively brief. I considered that it wasn't appropriate for me to place this burden and to ask questions on that period, the period of 1975-1979, and of the events that took place then. I wanted to wait for the situation to uh, dissipate. Uh, the newspapers and books had reported many things and uh, things that called for a sense of calmness to prevail. Judge Laverne, however, Mr. Witness, you must realize that our chief concern, the chief concern of this tribunal is that very period, the 1975-1979, 1975 to 1979 period. That is of the most interest to us. I'd also like to know if Mr. Kyu Sompon ever talked to you about his family. I believe that you were somewhat acquainted with his relatives, his mother, his sisters, his brothers. Mr. Witness, do you know anything about uh, his uh, family ties? Response, during our meetings in 1990, it was then, uh, during our conversations about family, that he told me that he lived uh, he told me that uh, his mother and his brother lived very far away from him and that uh, they could not live close to each other and he saw them uh, on a very seldom and rare basis. Judge Laverne, did he tell you where uh, his mother and brothers were? 
during uh, the period of democratic Kampuchea? Answer, I did not ask the question. I did not seek those kinds of details. What I did gather and what I do believe is that the two families of the two heads of states, be it uh, uh, Kyusompan or uh, Prince Norodom Sionuk, uh, their families had not been spared. Within the family of uh, Prince Norodom Sionuk, I believe that he left some, he lost some 14 uh, children and grandchildren, including uh, Mr. Sisovat Sitovi. And I believe during the time that Mr. Kyu Sompon was head of state, his family did not enjoy any preferential treatment. Judge Laverne, do you believe that you can compare the position that held Prince Nordom Sionok and that of Mr. Kyu Sompon? Do you know if Mr. Kyu Sompon sat on the central committee of the Communist Party of Kampuchea. Answer. I believe that both gentlemen served as heads of state. And in a country with a communist regime, a head of state plays a much more representative uh, role and does not enjoy significant power. Take, for example, the Cultural Revolution uh, and uh, who Mao Zedong eliminated. Everybody knew Kim Jong-un as the strong man. But King Yong-nam uh, has been head of states, uh, has been, was head of state uh, in North Korea and in the North Korean constitution, similar to the constitution of democratic Kampuchea, I believe that the role of the president of the presidium is a, a role uh, uh, that uh, is akin to that of a figurehead. He only receives heads, other heads of states, ambassadors, secretaries of states, etc. I can think of other examples, uh, but I don't know. No. Judge Laverne, I understand that this is your personal analysis, but did you at any point in time have a specific conversation with respect to Mr. Q. Sompon's exact role that he played during the democratic Kampuchea period? Do you have any information that you can bring before this tribunal uh, on that subject? Response. I do not know the facts. I did not have any in-depth conversations on that topic. I knew Mr. Kyo Sampong since 1957. However, I do not know the details of his life, particularly of his life during the 1975-1979 period. I am not in a position to answer. Judge Laverne, in your written statement, in your testimony, Mr. Julien Goffres, you state that you were rather shocked uh, upon reading the Constitution of Democratic Kampuchea and a particular provision, uh, that being Article 3 of the Constitution. Do you recall what Article 3 stipulates? Response, no, not exactly. I'm referring to the article on uh, culture. Response, oh yes. Yes, now that you make mention of it, uh, I do recall. The Constitution states that the previous culture and civilization of Cambodian up until 1975 had a detrimental effect on Uh, the country prior to the coming to power of the Khmer Rouge. And I believe that it was Article 11 that specified the role of the uh, presidents of the state presidium. 
Mr. Julien Gaufre, says Judge Levin, did you ever discuss at any point in time with Mr. Kiyosampo the role he played in the drafting of the Constitution? Did you hear what Mr. Kiyosampo's comments were when he himself unveiled the Constitution before the Cambodian country? The court has at its disposal a rather interesting report, E3 stroke 259. Response. I do not have any specifications to, re to make. However, one general comment is that the state of heads, uh, the speeches of heads of states do not uh, are rather broad. I believe that uh, uh, the speech that is delivered by the Queen of England is often drafted by the reigning government and that in a communist regime, a head of state is essentially controlled by the Secretary General of the Communist Party and is controlled by the government. Judge Lavelle, I'm not entirely sure if uh, the Queen of England is in, would ever uh, utter what I am about to read, but I would like to uh, quote from ERN 00, 72, 57, 98. This is chapter 3 with respect to the culture of Cambodia, popular culture, or healthy culture. These are the distinctive characteristics that are featured in our country. There is no uh, vandalists, no prostitutes. Our culture is a popular and independent culture. We are resolutely opposed to all cultures that are corrupt and reactionary. We are also opposed to the oppressing classes, which encompass the colonialists. Films and magazines, which are the vehicles of this corrupt culture, have been eliminated, as well as imperialists and foreign lackeys. We will behave ourselves according to our own values, as well as our, our nation and people. We shall not uh, imitate the decadent culture of foreign imperialists, such as has been done by the Lonnol clique. Look at what these Lonnol traitors have done with their partisans. I do not know how to describe this. Houses in Phnom Penh have absolutely no national character, and this is exactly why we are staunchly opposed to such a culture. If we allow this corrupt culture to plague our country, it will certainly undermine all of our efforts to defend our country and to preserve our independence and sovereignty. We resolutely reject the corrupt and reactionary culture of uh, imperialism. In the past, our people have always fought against uh, the uh, invasions of imperialists, and we will continue to battle on uh, resolutely with conviction in order to build a healthy, popular, and national uh, fatherland. Does this have any echoes, Mr. Witness, of what Mr. Q. saint paul could have said in Paris uh, during his studies and during the 1960s? Response. Just to return to the first sentence about defending popular culture and nationalist culture, yes. However, I heard him criticize the policy of absolute power, the absolute power of 
Prince Nordam Sionuk. However, I did not hear him utter any virulent criticism of traditional Cambodian culture. On the other hand, when he was in Paris, the Lono government was not yet established, but it was well known that there had been many abuses during the 1970 to 1975 period when with the support of the Americans a civil war was raging in Cambodia Kyu Sampan was quite critical of the uh, 1970 to 1975 period which was absolutely devastating for Cambodia with uh, the dropping of all of the American bombs. Judge Laverne, did Mr. Kyu Sampan ever tell you why it had been necessary to evacuate the cities following the liberation of Kampuchea? Response, he never talked to me about that. However, I have come to the following personal conclusion. After 1975, Phnom Penh was completely cut off and isolated from the external world. All supplies and commodities uh, were being uh, brought in by aircraft or by sea. And the Khmer Rouge had circled Phnom Penh and they were simply unable to provide enough food to the population. Therefore, the evacuation of the cities took place in absolutely horrifying conditions. However, uh, with hindsight, I do believe that uh, it was out of economic need. Uh, Judge Laverne, pardon me, are you saying that uh, the evacuation of the cities stems from an economic need? Is that what you said, sir? Response. Well, the city was receiving no supplies. Uh, supplies were only coming in by boat or by plane. And when the Khmer Rouge took over, there was simply no more uh, supplies of any sorts of commodities uh, through any channel, be it air or water. Therefore, the population had to return to the countryside. But I recognize, based on what I've heard, that the evacuations occurred in the most ghastly conditions. Judge Leven, therefore, is the evacuation something uh, for you that was foreseeable, or did it take, or was knowledge of this take you? Did knowledge of this take you by surprise? Response. It did not necessarily surprise me, but the conditions certainly appeared to me as horrible. Judge Laverne, do you know how many laws or decrees were passed by the People's Assembly, and do you know if there were any judicial institutions that were operational during the period of democratic Kampuchea? Response, I do not know at all. You know at the time that I was the managing director of financial services for the multinational Air Liquide, and so I was very busy with my work. I started my day at 7.30 and only ended at 8.30 in the evening. I was not working the 35-hour work weeks that we uh, know today in France. I was entirely devoted and essentially devoted to my work. And therefore, I had very little knowledge of what was happening in Cambodia at the time. Judge Laverne, earlier we talked about Insokan and Insopan. Did you know a person by the name of Insopip? Answer, yes. I met uh, him. It's a brother from the same family. And are you familiar with a book written by Mr. Insopip, which is entitled Kir Sompon? enlarged and real? Answer, no, I have no knowledge of that publication, but I believe that it would be of interest to me. Uh, Judge Laverne, yes, I agree with you. Mr. Witness, at this particular stage, I have no further 
questions. I know that other questions will uh, be put to you, which could uh, eventually spur further questions. However, for now, Mr. President, I have no further questions to put to the witness, and I wish to thank him uh, for his cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Witness, and thank you, Judge Lavange. Mr. Witness, we will take a 20 minutes break from now. The local time here is 2.55, and we shall resume at a quarter past three Cambodian time. The court is now in recess. Some